Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, we've reached chapter 10. So we're covering territory. The chapter of rushing to do good works. What do they translate the chapter as there? The chapter on he he hastening. hastening towards good deeds and encouraging the person who intend doing the work. When was the last time you told someone to hasten? <laughs> and hasten when you do that. Right. It's good to be hasty sometimes, of rushing to do good works. وَحَثُ مَنْ تَوَجَّهَ لِخَيْرٍ عَلَى الْإِقْذَارِ عَلَيْهِ بِالْجِدِّ مِنْ غَيْرِ تَرَدُّدْ And to incite or encourage the one who would direct themselves toward good things, to do it with all earnestness and not to hesitate. Right? If you get the idea to do something and you know it's a good thing, don't give your ego a chance to talk you out of it, right? Because the khawatir that come to a person, right, are three or four. The first is khawatir rabbani. So, divine thoughts, godly thoughts. God and then angelic thoughts and then hmm, egotistical thoughts and then shaitani thoughts, satanic thoughts, four different types of thoughts that will come to a person, okay, that will come to a person. So, you're walking about your day, and something pops into your head, right, you're going about whatever it is you're supposed to be doing going about, right, something pops into your head, where does that something come from? So by the nature of the thought, we can know where it comes from if it's a divine thought, Meaning, direct from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah sends inspiration to everyone. It's not revelation. You're not going to start a new religion tomorrow, right? But everything is inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the bee, the bumblebee, gets wahi. Malik. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired the bee. Huh? You know the surah? Surah to nahl A divine thought is one that is about the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sublimity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Closeness to Allah, getting nearer to Allah, nearer to the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are direct from Allah. Second thought is the angelic thought. An angel came and whispered in your ear. An angel came and gave you Right? This push to do what? Good things. Acts of ibadah. Doing good for another person. Right? Thinking positive. Right? Avoiding something that will put an obstacle between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That thought comes from the angel. That's why it's good to be on good terms with angels. Right? They're all around. And we want to keep them around. Because any spot that's taken up by an angel is not available to be taken up by a jinn or a shaitan or something else, right? So, khalas. Let's see how many we can get in the room. We remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a gathering, they're going to stuff the room. And they're going to pile on top of each other, all the way up into the heavens, right? They get really excited about such things. We should do more of such things then. SubhanAllah, how many angels could we bring to the United States? How many angels could we bring to California? And the angels are sitting there saying, California? Really? We have not been there in the longest time, right? All right, let's go check it out. SubhanAllah. The second are the egotistical thoughts. The egotistical thoughts are nafsani. They come from huh, your lower self. That nafs, that when we say the word nafs, we mean the ego, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala terms in the Quran, al nafsul ammara the commanding self that commands to do bad things, okay? So, Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam or ala nabiyyina wa alayhi afdal salatu wa atamu taslim, right, talks about, right, uh, that I'm not going to say that my nafs is innocent inna nafs ala ammaratun bisun, right? It commands to what is bad. That's that lower ego. That lower self are the, 
the thoughts that come from there are the thoughts to do things that are appetitive, right? To do things that huh, are not good with your limbs, to do things that are maybe mm, selfish, right? And those types of things, or to make those sins of um, the flesh, or the sins of the appetite, and all of those different types of things, that's coming from the ego. And then there are the satanic thoughts. The satanic thoughts come from, right, shayateen, that are working for the shaitan, right? So jinn, but also human beings that are doing work for shaitan. And those are the sneaky ones, and sometimes the downright evil ones. And they're trying to distance you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the ones that bring you doubts about the unicity of Allah and the risala of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those are the ones that huh, cause you to think wrong things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the ones that cause people huh, to think in conflict with proper ethics. Um, they come from the shayateen. Right? Because what is the shaitan's mission? To get you, and as many people as possible, further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, here, we're talking about that thought, that angelic thought, khatir, malaki, that comes to you to do something right, to do something good, subhanAllah. And under this title, he begins, radiallahu anhu, by citing the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, فَاسْتَبِقُ khayrat. So rush, race to do good things. And we've said before that this racing or competition to do good things is not a type of destructive competition. It means to, when you see other people doing good, you are inspired to go out and do good too. That's what it is. Not that type of competition where when you're racing, not us, not the BMX people, right? Those other people who shave their legs when you're doing like the, the touring racing, the road racing, I did a little bit of that too, right? Uh, when you're doing that and the person comes up, right, and shoves something, and actually in the mountain biking, we'd have this too. When you go around the bend in the mountains and there's no crowd and no one sees you, someone might take something and put it in the spokes of your bicycle, right, and breaks it up and you flip off and get all broken up and you're out of the race, right? So that type of competition when someone puts something in the spokes of your wheels to undermine what you're doing and to break you down, okay? Or to under, you know, or to maybe even uh, the piracy that goes on. They come over and they take all of your, uh, uh, you know, what it is you're trying to build and they make it hard in order so that you can't keep up and this type of thing. That sort of destructive type of competition that goes on. That's, we don't have people in the community who go and undermine others and do nasty stuff to others, right, to cause them to slip up or essentially undermine what they're trying to build fisa bilillah. Undermine what they're trying to build. We respect a man, we respect a woman who's working to put food on the table for their family, right? To keep a roof over the head of their family. And we respect that work that they're doing, but here we have a brother, here we have a sister who's trying to put food on the table of the house in Jannah. And we want to somehow undermine that. That's not cute, and it's not clever, and we shouldn't clap for such a person, you know, because what is somehow seen as clever in the dunya is not going to be seen that way in the akhirah, right? If we cannot be ethical people, then, you know, really, it's just identity politics, right? So, that is a destructive type of competition, to undermine our brothers and sisters. That's not what is being talked about here. So when that goes on, we don't come and say, well, Allah said race, compete with one another to do good. So here we are competing, like pick up basketball where there's a whole lot of trash talk and an elbow here and, you know, that type of thing. If you're on the basketball court and someone catches you in the mouth with an elbow, you're like, all right, you got me, you got me, right? And then the next play, right, you might do something else. Maybe on the basketball court. That's the type of game that people want to be involved in. But now when we're working for our loss of Hanukkah, subhanAllah.
right? We're not out to crush souls. We're not out to hurt feelings. Race. Move quickly to a forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in the doing of good deeds, whether they are good deeds that are an ibadah, that is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or a ma'una, or an effort to help and relieve the distress or difficulty of a fellow person, in that is a maghfira from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah wants, Allah has all this ghufran to give out. It's all there, and there's no shortage. If someone runs off and gets a whole bunch of ghufran and barakat and hasanat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't mean that there's now not enough to go around because so and so got it, right? Dahaba ahl al huh? bil ujur. The Sahaba complained to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the wealthy among us, they went and ran off with all of the ajr. Because they're giving all the money and all of this, and we have nothing to give. And the Prophet said, He could eat us be had in sadaqah. Right? In making dhikr is a sadaqah, in reminding people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a sadaqah. So there are so many ways, but some people in this world, they have huh, the, um, the mentality that there's not enough to go around. And therefore, we have to, com we have to huh, compete, we have to prevent, we have to block. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has so much good to give. Subhanallah, there is enough to go around if we all huh, uh, operated with this plenitude perspective on life, where would we get to? Right? We wouldn't be third nations within a first nation, we would be a first nation, even though the first nation are the Native Americans, right? But still, we will be a leading community, but we're not a leading We need to get back to who we are. So idnat is a ghufran that you are rushing to when you do something good. Allahu fi'awnil abdi ma dam al abdu fi'awni akhi. Allah is in the assistance and the support of his slave so long as the slave is in the assistance and support of his brother. Now, hey, it's, that's a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brother, that wasn't a hadith, right? I mean, it's a hadith, but it's not from the book yet. We didn't get there. I'm moving too slowly. Ma'ufiratim min rabbika and a jannah. The Jannah are these people who look out for the is for those people who look out for their fellow man. The Ridwan of the best of you, huh? The humanity. And Nasu. And Nas. He didn't say the believers. He didn't say the Muslims. And Nasu Ayalullah. Wa khayrukum khayrukum na the ayali. The people, not the Muslims, people are the, huh, what is it, the, 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 um, ayal, right, me, we use it, the Egyptians use it for children, but ayal means the, who are the people that you put on your taxes, what do you call them? Dependents. What's that? Independents. So people are the dependents of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya'uluhum, he's supporting them. Right? And the Egyptians use that word for children. It doesn't mean the people are the children of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But affectionately, mashihalu. Because we know we're not being literal. Mahik? We know that, right? Yeah. Okay. Right? The people are the dependents of Allah, and the best of you are the best of you to his dependents. Subhanallah. Here we, and here we go. And in that is the Jannah. Whose width is that of the heavens and the earth, and it was... I'm prepared for people who have taqwa, right? To have caution when it comes to the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. And the first hadith in the Bab. He says, he narrates from Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, that the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam said, Babiru bil a'mal saliha fa satakunu. It's as if we read this last week. Right? So rush to do good 
works because there will be crises and chaoses and tragedies fitten that will be like a piece of dark night. Did you ever be in a dark night, maybe way outside of the city? You can't see your hand in front of your face. It will be so dark, people won't be able to know which way is up from down, which way is right and which way is wrong. They'll get lost. If someone gets lost in the middle of a dark night, what do we do? Do we give them a lecture? Do we wag our finger at them? Do we blame them? Or do we try to help them get to a safe place? Huh? Do we try to help get them a light? Right? So if you do have a light, what's that light for? To get out to those people. You think that the rescue teams that go out there and someone's you know, boat got... Uh, they didn't get into harbor soon enough, or they lost their way out on the open ocean. The helicopter comes, and the you know the uh, safety person uh, lowers down on the cable. And when he gets down, and the people are like trying to stay above the water, and they've been out there for hours, and maybe it's winter time, and they're about to get hypothermia, and he gets down just close enough, and he stops, and he says, starts wagging his finger. You already know you shouldn't have been out here like this. Is that what goes on? When they get them back up into the helicopter, do they scold them? When they get them to the hospital and treat the hypothermia, are they worried about scolding them? Do you think that, who scolds them? Maybe their parents or something like that. But really, it doesn't matter at this point. The people who go out onto the highways and get people, extricate people from their cars with the jaws of life and things like that, right? A can opener for a vehicle. They're not scolding someone, right? They are fulfilling their own meaning of existence by helping another human soul. Can we like get to a point where we can be as good as a kafir that is on call and has a real job, but when someone is in an extremely precarious situation hanging off a cliff, the extraction specialist, that we can go out there? Huh? And just because it completes me as a human being, um, thank you for the opportunity for letting me feel like I'm still a human being. Huh? Because sometimes we forget. Can we reach that level? Or we need to wag a finger a little bit because that's what makes us feel like we're righteous. SubhanAllah. So, so people are going to be in the pitch black and they're not going to know. People come up and you would not believe the stuff that they don't know, that we take for granted. Now, left from right. There will be fitten, like a piece of dark night, a man will wake up in the morning as a believer and go to sleep at night as a disbeliever. And another will go to sleep at night as a believer and wake up in the morning as a disbeliever. And I seek refuge in Allah that I become that person because you don't know what the next phase of your life has in store for you. You may be going along thinking, MashaAllah, right? I got it like that. But you don't know what's going to happen to you. Why? Because your faith is not from your cleverness. It's a gift that Allah has given you and He did not have to. The first thing in Sunni Aqidah that you learn is that no one forces Allah to do anything. He doesn't have to reward people who do good things. Nor does He have to punish people who do bad things. If Allah wanted to, why? Because this is His game and this is His huh, design. This is His t test and He sets the terms. It just happens to be that He set them in the way that we know, but He didn't have to. If he wanted, he could flip it and reward the people that disobey him and punish the people that obey him. He can do that. He promised he wouldn't. And he's true to his promise, alhamdulillah. But it could have been otherwise. We should not think that our faith is something we've earned. We should not think that our faith is something that comes from our cleverness. It's a gift that Allah gives. And if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, nobody gets into Jannah by their actions, 
And they say, not even you, Rasulullah. He said, not even me, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala envelops me with His Rahmah. Hmm? We do good actions because that's, if you want to find Rahmah of Allah, if you want to get to the Jannah of Allah, the best place to start looking is where good actions are. That's why we go there. That's why we do those good actions, because we know that those are the actions of the people that will gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we also know at the end of the day that He makes the final decisions. And that's scary. Isn't that the essence of taqwa? Hmm? Isn't it with both fear and hope that the believer can fly? Hmm? Fear and hope is a balance, and balance is what we seek for in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because when He built the world, huh, and He built the sky, He set up the balance with the assignment to Bani Adam to keep the balance. It's your job to keep a balance. Let's not be unbalanced. So we keep that balance, but of course, if one is going to outbalance the other when you're young and healthy, keep fear. In fact, if one's going to preponderate, the fear side should preponderate. But when people get to the end of life, or when they go into the hospital, or when something goes wrong and there's a good chance that they might be close to death, we flip it and we emphasize hope. Because not much more is going to go on after that. right? And they have to die with a hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So we switched to hope. How we got onto that tangent, I do not know. People are in the middle of darkness. So don't think that your faith is something that you got because you're shot there. Hmm? And what does he explain for why this is happening? Because he sells his deen for some little trinket of dunya. He sells his deen for some little trinket of dunya. Meaning, what is, how does that play out? Some people get bought out. Some people sell out. Okay, yeah, I'll go inform on people or I'll create a case against other Muslims for this, this, and this. Or, I'm so angry about the way I was treated in that mosque that I'm going to go on TV and I'm going to start a career that's just about ta attacking Islam. Yeah, okay, this person bought uh, dunya for the price of his deen. But what about people who, for the sake of being close to money, or power are willing to institutionalize not following the ethics of Islam to make that right the policy right that we don't actually try to follow we fall short in everything in so many things right? all of us are falling short why because we're Bani Adam and it's in our DNA why because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala structures into our DNA the need for his forgiveness, the need for his repentance. Huh? And that is why we exist. Kullu bani Adam khatta. Every child of Adam makes mistakes. Every child of Adam sins. You see someone out there making mistakes. You see someone out there sinning. Bani Adam, right? And the best of them are the ones who love Allah and his messenger enough to find their way back and to ask Allah to forgive them. And then what are they going to do? They're going to keep out going out and making mistakes. But what we hope is this, is that the mistakes of tomorrow are a little bit more subtle and fine-tuned and not the mistakes of yesterday. That we learn from our mistakes. That's the hope. But how quick a learner are you? In math class, maybe someone's really quick. Not me, but someone. Right? Most of you all, I'm sure, are like real shelter in math, right? Tell you. People like us, we go into humanities, social sciences. I right? hate. There's benefit there. I tell you. So someone is going to be a quick learner here and a slow learner here. Okay? But at the end of the day, we learn and we pass the mathematics we have to pass to get our degrees. Right? We pass statistics to get the psychology degree and stuff like that. Right? We learn. But at what pace? Huh? If I'm real shorter in math, mashallah, should I look down on the people who struggle with mathematics? If I'm real shorter 
in fasting, shall I look down on the people that struggle with fasting? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't even seem fair because Allah gifted me. And then pretty much everybody is gifted somewhere. We just haven't found where that gift is sometimes in ourselves or in the other person. But everyone is gifted too. Now, so if we're gifted in one place and someone else is not gifted in the same place, what's actually supposed to happen? A lot of finger wagging? Because you know what they say in my country where I come from. Right, where I come from, they say, every time you point a finger at somebody, right, there's four more pointing back at you, right? So, subhanAllah, what's supposed to happen is that we complete one another, right? When one person is strong in this area and the other person is strong in this area, the first thing we have to do is we have to recognize and acknowledge. And then, it's not a competition. Right? We all carry the weight. SubhanAllah. Diversity and being different is what makes us strong. Do you want in the fall? How many people have been on the East Coast in the fall? Right? In the autumn. Northeast. Northeast. So let's erase all that. Northeast. How many people are in the Northeast? Right? In the, in the autumn. You've never been in the Northeast in the autumn? Okay. How many people have been in Northwest Frontier Province in the autumn? Bunch of Indians in here, right? MashaAllah. I'm preferring Indians these days. I'll tell you. How many of you have seen a picture of the trees changing colors in the autumn? Right? Do y'all have trees that change colors in the autumn in, in Bosnia? Not many. <laughs> okay, well, anyway. Get on some, country. Some. In the Northeast, right? The tree, and y'all seen pictures of this. They change all these different colors. And people love those pictures. They're absolutely beautiful in Canada. They have this effect, right? And it's the most beautiful pictures. Do we want all those leaves to turn the exact same color? Right? You know? I mean, the cedars in northern Lebanon are like really nice too. But that's part of the beauty is all of these different colors together. And that's what we should be looking for in a healthy community is people with different strengths and, ta and talents working together to create something that is beautiful. Right? That is beautiful. Yeah, Rabbi. Because, no, we'll move on, inshaAllah. Second hadith. From Abi Sarua'ah. Ah, Sirwa'ah. Because Rasini wa Fadhiha Sarwa'ah. Right? Sirwa'ah or Sarwa'ah. عقبة بن الحارث رضي الله عنه قال صليت وراء النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بالمدينة العصرة فسلم ثم قام مصريا We did read this last week. What hadith did we actually stop on? We did read this last week, no? I'm fairly certain because he went to distribute the, yeah. the funds that he had in his house. We did. Where did we stop? 89. Got you. Okay, so moving along to hadith number three. MashaAllah, we cover more territory than I remember. But I think we got a little bit of different perspective on hadith number one. I saw things I didn't remember from last week in the hadith. An Jabir radiallahu anhu qaal qaal rajulun lil nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yawma ahadin ara'ayta in kutil tu fa'ayna ana a man said to the Prophet والسلام, on the day of the Battle of Uhud, huh? if I'm killed today, where do you see me ending up? And he said, Fil Jannah, in the garden. So he had some tamarat, right? In his hand that he was eating in order to get some energy for the upcoming battle, right? He threw them out. He went straight into the battle and he fought until he was killed. And rushed to a malfira from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sacrifice in battle. Hmm? Sacrificing one's soul in battle against people who are trying to 
actively harm you themselves or harm any innocent people themselves, they are in the action. They are, if you don't stand in their way, they are going to be killing people and harming people. Standing up to protect those innocent people and losing one's life in the process is a great and tremendous sacrifice. It is not a romantic motif. Mm, how good do I look in a shawar kameez and an AK-47? MashaAllah. They'll take pictures of me and put it on social media, right? Because I look good. Those romantic motifs don't exist. Nobody in Bosnia is wearing Sidwell kameezes in the beginning. And hardly anybody was carrying anything, right? Because people had to trade it off, right? Huh? When a person goes out for a while, right, then he has to come back and he switches it out to his partner because there was nothing for people to defend their families. And it didn't look good. People up there in tennis shoes, right? People are Afghanistan in track shoes too, but... Um, the point is, is that it's not romantic. It's doing something that needs to be done in the moment that it needs to be done. And if for any reason... Huh? SubhanAllah, we were taught by the scholars that we studied with that even when the terms of the conflict seem clear, you have one armed party trying to harm another nation and people standing up to stop that harm, but unless the terms of the conflict are clearly on the side of proper ethics. And here we mean the ethics of conflict, right? Even if it is according to the terms of the Geneva Convention, that it's not lawful to participate in such a conflict. Some people get it in their head or they get so much anger that they just want to lash out at anybody they can lash out at because they're so upset about something else. These people seem to be associated with those people but then they become murderers. They become the ones. But in their minds, they have all these fantasies, and they're just getting themselves into the hellfire. And they're harming a lot of innocent people in the process. But sometimes a person has to stand up. And just like Rasulullah said, don't wish to be in that moment. Don't long to be in that moment. Don't hope to have a moment like that, because you don't know which way it's going to go and you don't want to be in a situation where the person on the other side also prays five times a day. That's a seriously confusing situation. At the Battle of Safin, there were Sahaba that just walked off the battlefield and just sat down and just said, I can't. I can't do this. Why? Because they were honest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't wish for the meeting with the enemy but if you find yourself in a situation that you did not ask for, then know that Jannah is under the shade of swords. But people rush. Just like, maybe, or not just like, but akin to the idea of the Sahaba in Mecca when they couldn't take the torture and they went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and said, aren't you going to pray for us? We're dying out here. They're torturing us. They're killing us. Huh? They're maiming us. They're raping our women in Mecca. And he said, there were people that came before you and they underwent so much torture until they said, when is the help? And even their prophet said, when is the help of Allah going to come? But you are a people who are in a rush and will have young people that are so angry at the images that they see on television, usually happening to some other people that they don't even know. And they're in a rush to have some type of experience that they have a fantasy about. Don't wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you that moment that's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. Huh? Don't wish for that. Be a human being. But sometimes it comes. And don't be a coward if it comes down on you. Stand up and be ready to go. But we've said in this class so many times before that there will continue to be themes in the teachings of Islam that are 
directly and literally relevant, maybe not to us in the circumstances that Allah has put us, and they may be literally relevant to someone in the north of Syria. Somebody, huh, in another place where they have been plunged into a conflict that they didn't ask for, and then maybe it becomes literal, but we're not stupid people and we're not literal people, and we can understand that when Allah has placed us somewhere, where? That's not a choice that we have to make when we leave the house every day. Huh? That we can also, but that doesn't mean that these hadith are shut down, and there's nothing to be learned from them. SubhanAllah. This man, he sacrificed what was probably never going to be replaced for him to do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger hoping to gain the contentment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how many situations that this is its template might we face in our life here today subhanallah we're smart people we're intelligent people وَالْقَلَمِ وَمَا يَسْتُرُونَ اقْرَأْ Huh? Read was the first of the revelation, and Allah swears by the pen. لَعَلَّكُمْ huh? تَعْقِلُونَ That perhaps you might use your intellect. We're not dumb people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to our intellect and also speaks to our soul and tells us not to forget the rights of our bodies or the bodies of others. Huh? And we're smart people and we're expected to be intelligent people. So let's stop acting like we're not intelligent people. You know? And let's embrace that. The Europeans would inherit the logic that was first recorded by the Greeks. But not until it passed through the filters of the Arabs, the Muslims who made changes and alterations that are still part of foreign, uh, uh, formal logic in Europe today. Hmm? SubhanAllah. When an attorney has to study logic to become an attorney, right, or a litigator, they have to study logic. And what they're studying in every single country in the world, including the United States and wherever else they're going to law school, they're studying rules that were Huh? set up and filtered by Arab scholars or Muslim scholars. Some of them were not, um, Ibn Sina, of course, was not an Arab. Uh, and he made major uh, adjustments to, uh, to logic. So we're supposed to be intelligent people. But it's true. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, نَحْنُ أُمَّةٌ أُمِّيٌّ لا نقرأ ولا نحسب سوموا لرؤيته وأفطروا لرؤيته We are an illiterate nation. Huh? We don't read and we don't count. Why? There's a lot of Muslims out there in the world and not all of them are educated. And that's okay. So, سيروا على سير أضعافكم Right? Travel according to your, the abilities of your weakest link. Don't leave people behind. But the fact that we are happy and content to stand in prayer next to a person who comes from a different socioeconomic situation than ourselves, that does not dress as well as ourselves, that is a different color or a different race than ourselves, and we see everyone Huh? Like the teeth of a comb. The fact that we don't mind if people are not deep thinkers. We are fine to make sure that there are teachings of Islam that will embrace people at every level like the Quran. When you read it, there is something in it. Each time you read it for your level. If your level is low, and we have people in this country and in our ummah who read at a sixth grade level, or at a fifth grade level, right? We have presidents who read at a sixth grade level and speak at a third grade level, third grade playground level, right? We have people who can't read at a high school level and some of them have really good jobs and big bank accounts, right? 
And then we put them in charge, which is weird. All of that's okay, but does that mean that we also can't have a discourse that operates at just a university level? Right? Many people at university are not actually working at a university level. We have something for these people and these people. Why? Because Islam is not one-dimensional. Islam is not black or white. We can embrace all different types of people and we can feed and nourish people at all different levels. Huh? We don't have to run elementary school Islam. You know? That's not a civilizational world view. We love to remember the greatness of the golden years of Islamic civilization. Huh? But what did the poet say? لَيْسَ الْفَتَى مَنْ قَالَ كَانَ أَبِي إِنَّمَا الْفَتَى مَنْ قَالَ هَا أَنَا The noble young man, the fine young man, is not the one who says, my father used to be this and my father used to be that. I'm sure all of us could tell great stories about our great-great-grandfathers and who they were and what they did, but do I get satiated and satisfied by the food or the meal that was eaten by someone else? No. The noble young man is not the one who said, my father is this and my father is that. The noble young man is the one who says, here I am. Here's what I do. SubhanAllah. But if we want to remember those glory days of some great Islamic civilization that no longer is, then we're claiming to be people who represent a civilization. If it is true that somehow there is a link by ethnicity or blood or place of origin or language of origin or by embracing something that goes beyond the physical world and having your heart linked to the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through shahada and the resonance of Alastu bi rabbikum qalu bala Naam? If we have that link to those civilizations, let's then be people who represent civilization by thinking civilizational thoughts which we cannot do if it's just me and my friends and we all think the exact same way. We need all different types of people to complete that mosaic and make something beautiful and balance out. But because we can't do that, all we can say is, well, you know, the Tao has this idea of yin and yang where there's this, you know, balance and completion and all of that, which is a wonderful thing, but can we find it in Islam? without having to call it the Tao of Islam. When we're calling it the Tao of Islam, it means that we've lost it. And we need someone else's civilization in order to maybe find something or recognize something of our own. We're not scuba. We don't have the self-contained underwater breathing apparatus within our own civilizational culture. Right? SubhanAllah, what we could do if we could just listen to the deen and learn from what it wants to tell us. I'm wasting a lot of your time by going running off on tangents. I'm so sorry. So, we read number three, Jannah. So the idea of sacrificing huh, oneself, sacrificing what is dear for something that's bigger than me, for a cause that's other than me. Let me leave you with one idea. Okay? There are beautiful people out there, innocent people, sincere people, who actually believe that there are things that are more important than themselves, and they are willing to sacrifice not just the extra money, not just things for a tax write-off, but money they need, items they need, or sacrifice something of themselves, or maybe even sacrifice a great career just to do something that they believe is bigger than themselves. Let's promise one another that we will not be that person who makes them feel stupid for doing that. 
we will not be that person who steps on their soul and crushes it because they thought there were things bigger than themselves worth sacrificing themselves for. Let's not crush people for thinking that altruism is a real thing. Helping another person when there's nothing in it for me. Because wallahi, wallahi we have in our Muslim community people who are doing just that. Making people feel stupid for believing in Islam. In the name of Islam. That's what's going on. And you want to know why people don't want to come to your masajid. You, don't want, you want to know why people don't want to participate in the deen or people are leaving the deen or don't want to have anything to do with Muslims. We come here but we don't realize that there is a serious crisis going on out there. A crisis of faith. Not a crisis of faith in one individual. Not the crisis of faith of Imam Ghazali and me and Imam Ghazali were kindred spirits because we're just alike. A crisis of faith on a national level. The only way to figure out how to deal with it after acknowledging and realizing that it's going on is to just be quiet and listen and learn something that we don't understand from the people that are suffering through it. SubhanAllah. Allah help us. He says in the fourth hadith, Abu Huraira says that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, what sadaqa is greatest in reward? And he said, Anta sadaqa wa anta sahihun shahihun takhshal fakra wa ta'mul al ghina. I don't know what the point of reading this stuff anymore is. We don't take it seriously. Like, why do we read this? What is the best charity that is uh, uh, the charity that is best in reward? And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that you give in charity and you are healthy and not scared. You're not giving charity because, oh my gosh, the doctors can't do anything for me, but maybe Allah can step in and intervene. You are healthy, shahihun, and you actually really just would rather hold on to your money. Meaning, you're hesitant, right? We talked about that hesitation. You'd really rather hold on to it, you're afraid of poverty, and you're hoping to become more wealthy. Meaning, when your nafs is actually more inclined not to give that charity and you're not scared of anything, that charity is the best. وَلَا تُمْهِلْ حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُومَ قُلْتَ لِفُلَانٍ كَذَا وَلِفُلَانٍ كَذَا وَقَدْ كَانَ لِفُلَانٍ SubhanAllah. And you don't just wait until it's too late for you to use your money and you say, this is going to go to so-and-so and this is going to go to so-and-so, right? You do it before all of that happens. SubhanAllah. You don't wait until your soul is about to leave your body. It's about to reach the throat and then you're willing to give it up because now you're satisfied that you're never going to enjoy it again, right? You do it before that happens. SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah is in the assistance and support of his slave so long as his slave is in the assistance and support of his brother. 
Elsewhere, the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that whoever relieves the distress of a believer in this life, Allah will relieve his or her distress in the next life. SubhanAllah. Here we go, relieving the distress of another. I have known women who scour the city that they live in to find the people in the most distress. And when they find them, they won't tell their friends where that family is. One of them comes back to the group and said, I found a family that lives in a cave. Like, oh, where? I'm not telling you. SubhanAllah. I know a city where when a man dies, and his mature children come to look through his estate and see what's going on and set straight his affairs after they buried him, find that there are five families that he has been supporting completely in the city and no one knew about it. And then they find out that he only inherited those families from his father. And the son is proud to take care of those families. You find someone in distress, these people get excited over that. I've known cities where if someone slept in the street once in that city, the men and women of that city would find that as an insult to themselves and an embarrassment that cannot be tolerated. If someone needs an operation and they can't get it, they would find it an insult to the city and themselves and their honor and an embarrassment that could not be tolerated. When you find someone in distress, this is a boon for you. Allah has sent you an Eid. SubhanAllah. And that person suffering in distress has done you a favor that you should be grateful for. And you're just fortunate that Allah's Messenger والسلام, didn't make you obligated to wash their feet like they deserve. To kiss their hands and their foreheads because of what they've brought into your life. They've done you a favor. And that's how the world turns. And that's فَاسْتَبِقُوا إِلَى الْخَيْرَاتِ so rush to do good deeds. That's what that means. SubhanAllah. But we don't think with the world view of a civilization. And we don't think with a world view that is shaped by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone just said the other day, they had a quiz at uh, a university that we were out at in Merced. The other day they said, what is the most prevalent name on the face of the earth? And apparently it's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What should that mean and what does that mean? Subhanallah. What should that mean and what does that mean? At some point, Muslims are going to have to make a choice. Am I going to be someone who feels like I'm in the prison of Islam? and I just have to try to make it as easy as I can while I'm here, right? Because there's no escape. Brothers and sisters, if you want out, the door is open. No one's saying you have to stay here. Allah told you you have to stay here, but, you know, if you feel froggish, leave. You don't have to stay here. You're free. You are her. You can make your own decisions, and if you don't like it in here, with Islam and the Muslims and the Deen of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, no one's telling you got to stay. Right? You turn 18, you can go. People have to make a decision: Am I stuck being Muslim, or am I, am I inspired to be a Muslim? Do I want to rise up to that challenge? Do I want to be part of the mission of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Huh? Kiflaini min rahmati, two portions of his rahmah, and carry water to people who need water. Water of what? Real water, maybe real water. Metaphorical water, yes indeed. Huh? Because rahmah will bring dead earth back to life. 
do I want to join the program of Muhammad? Uh -huh. But there's a price, because you know if you want to join the gang, you know how you got to get in, right? How do you get into a gang? How do you get into a gang? What is your name, Sayyidah? The BMX. Fatima, right? They have to jump you in. You know what it means to jump you in? Right? So the gang has to all come together. They do it to the girls too. The girl wants to join the gang and they all you have to try to stay on your feet while they all beat you up for like a whole minute. Right? And you and you get high points and respect. If you can stay up, you're not gonna stand up. Right? You're gonna be broken up and you're going to pee blood for weeks. For a week, right? But that's how you get in. If you really want in, you'll do it. So if you want to be, what did he say? He said to the Prophet ﷺ in the middle of the night when he came out to pray to Hajjud and he jumped the Sahabi to join him into Hajjud and he said, I love you Rasulullah ﷺ and he said, then prepare for poverty. Prepare to be poor. Huh? Because if you want to be in this, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. Huh? And stuff that's worth anything doesn't come easy. It doesn't fall in your lap like your iman fell in your lap. It's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you want to be with that, you want to protect it, but there's going to be some bumps in the road. I have known people who come and they say, I'm scared because my life is going too well. Maybe Allah doesn't want me. Subhanallah. But we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَكِنْ عَافِيَتُكَ أَوْسَعُ لِي Like the Prophet said, right? I complain to you of the weakness. أَشْكُوا إِلَيْكَ دَعْفَ قُوَّتِي The weakness of my strength or my capacity. وَقِلَّ تَحِيلَتِي And I don't have any solutions. I can't figure out what to do next. Nothing seems to be working. إِذَا مَنْ تَكِلُنِي Who are you going to send me to? Are you going to send me to someone who doesn't know me, who's going to treat me like garbage? Or are you going to give me over to be owned by my closest relatives and my closest people who are going to treat me like a stepchild? But so long as you're not angry with me, I don't care. But your good health is better for me that you give me good health and you make it easier for me that works out a little bit more to my liking and I could I could get used to that. What I can But it would be more expensive if you made it easier. And I seek refuge in you by the light of your face upon which is rectified the affairs of the heavens and the earth that you not release your anger upon me or send down your wrath on me. But you can do what you want until whenever you want. Like al Utba hatta tarda. Na'am wala hawla wala quwwata illa bik. And there's no ability and there is no capacity unless you give it. Subhanallah, Rasulullah, on his way out of Ta'if. And what would become? What would be the faraj that will come after when he would own all of Mecca? And he could destroy all of Mecca. And he could bring down his vengeance on all of those people. And they are eating from his hand, saying, Akhul Khair, Ibn Akhul Khair, or Akhul Kareem, Ibn Akhul Kareem. SubhanAllah, what a noble soul. And this world needs a noble soul. It could have noble souls, but you have to drink from the hand of the Prophet ﷺ. Did I literally say that? Right? Are we that shallow? Well, if all you study is shallow books and you haven't read a book, right, since your graduate school exams, right, well then maybe you will think in that way. Drink from the hand of the Prophet ﷺ. Say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever you hear his name and say a few extras and read about his behavior and read about his character and read about and learn about and stick with people who embody 
the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it will be as if you are drinking from the hand of the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam as he's pouring out from you meanings and understandings and comprehensions from the kawthar. And if you embody them with true love, maybe you'll meet him at kawthar. And you won't just drink from a glass or a cup, but maybe from his hand. But whoever drinks from that kawthar will never ever be thirsty any time after. And when you drink from the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, you feel like a thirst within you has been quenched. But at some point, you have to stop. Huh? Someone gives you the drink. At some point, you mature enough to look around and see if the person next to you is thirsty and share it. Subhanallah. That's probably enough for today. Allah bless you and bless your families and bless us and bless our family. Allah give you openings and give us openings. Allah make your feet firm and make us firm. Allah make things easy for you and make things easy for us. And Allah give courage and relief from distress and health from illness to all of the families that are around here. For the sake of the Prophet ﷺ, for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, barakallahu feekum wa ahsan ilaykum. Have a beautiful, beautiful Thursday night, right? Assalamu alaikum.